Hello, Integrated Math One. Welcome to lesson 1.3.2. We're in our unit talking about linear regressions, and we last time we did a best line of fit. We're going to start moving a little more today into correlation. Um, to get us started, we do have a lovely warm-up here on the screen for you with a couple of problems, and I would just like you to describe a possible flaw in the reasoning for each situation. So can you go ahead and hit pause, jot down some thoughts you have on why these statements might be a little flawed, and then hit play to continue the discussion. So I have a few reasons that I came up with. Um, maybe your reasons are a little different than mine, but I'm just gonna show you what I was thinking. So if I wash my hands regularly, I will not get sick. Um, People who wash their hands regularly still get sick sometimes, right? I mean, that happens. It's just a thing. Don't get me wrong. Washing your hands definitely helps, but it's not 100% going to stop everything. Um, if I practice my guitar every day, I will be a rock star. <laughs> as great as that would be, there are many people who practice a guitar every day, and they're still not going to be rock stars, and that's okay. If I wear my favorite football jersey to support the team, they will win the game. We all would like to believe this, but many people wear their favorite jerseys, but the team they are supporting may still lose the game. Um, you wearing the jersey, it's great to support your team, but that doesn't necessarily mean they'll win. And last but not least, if I am a good driver, I will not have an accident. Um, unfortunately, good drivers still have accidents because it's not always about you, right? Even if you're the best driver in the world, there are crazy people out there. And so you may still end up having an accident and it may or may not even be your fault. That can still happen even if you're a good driver. So we're on page 177 in case you didn't notice. And as I said, today we're talking about correlation. So our goals for today, we're going to determine something called a correlation coefficient. And we're going to use technology to help us do that because it's pretty complicated to do it by hand. Um, we're going to interpret the correlation coefficient. This is another important thing. Not only are we going to find this in correlation coefficient, we're going to interpret what it actually means. What is it trying to tell us about our data? And we are going to learn to understand the difference between R and R squared. There is a difference between these. And if there's time, we're going to talk about a few other things, including understanding the difference between correlation and causation. There is a difference. And understand necessary conditions. We'll talk about that just a little bit toward the end. Um, as well as understanding sufficient conditions. Um, we always do want to choose a level of accuracy appropriate when reporting quantities as well. So our terms today, we have a bunch of terms. Go with it. Um, correlation, correlation coefficient, coefficient of determination, causation, necessary condition, sufficient condition, and uh, common response, and confounding variable. We've got so many of these today. And some of these are going to be more important to us than others. Correlation and correlation coefficient, those are really going to be the big ones, but we'll touch on the others as well as we go. So you have learned how to write a best line of fit using the least squares method, right? We used Desmos last time to help us write a line of best fit, a regression line that fits our data. So how do you know if that line actually produces valid, usable results, right? Is there a way to measure the strength of the relationship between variables? So you've made this line, that's what we did last time, we made a line of best fit, but is there a way to measure how good that line is? Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So I would like you to start off on page 178 here, M1-178. I'd like you to consider each relationship shown. So I would like you to take just a moment to describe any associations between the independent and dependent variables. And then, um, if possible, draw a line of best fit. Um, so go ahead, and these lines of best fits are probably going to be an approximation. If you really want to go into Desmos and try to get it precise, you're welcome to do so. But um, for now, let's just do an estimate on our line of best fit. So go ahead on these problems of A, B, and C. Can you describe the association? Is it a positive association, a negative association? Is there kind of no association? They're all over the place. Um, and then hit play to check your work, see how you did. it. 
So I'm noticing that as the weight of my vehicle increases, my miles per gallon decreases. Are you noticing that? That the heavier the vehicle, the worse gas mileage you get? So I'm gonna say there's a negative association between weight and miles per gallon, right? As the weight increases, my miles per gallon decreases. Um, so negative association, it's going down, isn't it? For B, I had a hard time, like even just trying to draw a line. Like for this one, I can draw a rough line that's kind of coming down that matches my data. I couldn't even draw a line for this. So far as I could tell, there is no association between IQ score and your height, right? You could have a really high IQ and be short or be tall, right? It could go either way. So I said there was no association between IQ score and height. There's no line of best fit here, right? <laughs> I can't draw a line that's going to make sense here. And last one, part C, um, I have my time spent studying and my grades on my algebra test. And I noticed the more time spent studying, the higher the grades on our algebra test. I could draw a line coming through here that would very much be positive, wouldn't it? A positive association between time spent studying on grades and, uh, pardon me, between time spent studying and grades on an algebra test, right? As time spent studying increases, grades on the algebra test increase. Kind of how it works, isn't it? So what you're finding here is a correlation. A measure of how well a regression fits a set of data is called correlation. The correlation coefficient is a specific number. It's an actual mathematical number, a value between negative one and one, which indicates how close the data are to the graph of the regression equation. So it's literally a number between negative one and one that's measuring how good is that line of fit, right? How, how close is that, is that relationship? The closer the correlation coefficient is to one, the stronger the positive correlation. The closer the correlation coefficient is to negative one, the closer to a negative correlation it is. If your correlation coefficient ends up being closer to zero, then there's not really a good correlation. So if you're getting a number, a correlation coefficient really close to one or really close to negative one, it's a strong correlation. It's a strong relationship. If your correlation coefficient is getting kind of close to zero, it's not a very strong relationship there. We usually use the variable R, and I'm going to highlight and underline this. I feel like it's important. We usually use the variable R to represent our correlation coefficient. And maybe you've seen that somewhere before. So the correlation coefficient falls between negative one and zero if the data shows a negative association, or between zero and one if the data shows a positive association. So I would like you to take a look at these problems. We've got three of them again, A, B, and C. In fact, I think they're similar scatter plots, not exactly the same as the one before. But I would like you to determine whether the points in each scatter plot have a positive correlation, a negative correlation, or no correlation at all. The other thing is there are four possible R values given. R is our correlation coefficient. Circle the R value you think is most appropriate and uh, feel free to explain your reasoning. So go ahead and hit pause to do A, B, and C. Hit play when you're ready to check your work. So there's a little note off to the side here. The closer the R value gets to zero, the less of a linear relationship there is in the data. And we kind of talked about that earlier. Well, I see very much a negative correlation here. Do you see that? There is totally a negative correlation here, right? As my X gets bigger, my Y gets smaller. So definitely a negative correlation. Um, and also looks pretty tight. Like it's not perfect, but I could draw a line through that pretty easily, couldn't I? So I feel like that's a very strong negative correlation. So I want one of the negative guys. Ooh, and we said a strong correlation is closer to one. A weaker correlation is closer to zero. So I'm going to pick this one right here. R equals negative 0 0.9. 
For B, I'm taking a look and I can see it's definitely a positive correlation, right? It's definitely moving up as my X values get bigger, so do my Y values. So definitely a positive correlation. It's a little more spread out than the other one was, but still I could, I could draw a line through that pretty well. So it's definitely a positive correlation. So that means for my R value, I need to pick between 0 0.7 and 0 0.07. We said closer to one is gonna be a stronger correlation and closer to zero is less. I'm gonna go with R equals 0 0.7. It's a, it's a pretty close, not as close as the last one, but still pretty good correlation. So pretty good correlation coefficient. C, these are all over the place, aren't they? I don't see any correlation. Like, do I draw a line up? Do I draw a line down? I don't see one. So I'm going to say there's no correlation. And so that means if I had to choose from these for no correlation, we want to get as close to zero as possible. So I'm going to pick for my correlation coefficient. I'm going to say R equals 0 0.01. It's pretty far off. Now, there is a mathematical way to calculate your correlation coefficient. I am about to show you the mathematical formula. Don't panic. I'm going to show you how you can do it on your computer. I'm using Desmos. I'm not going to make you, I'm not going to make you do it by hand because that's the formula. Oh my goodness. You can calculate the correlation coefficient of a data set using this formula. That formula is a nightmare. I don't want to attempt that formula. I'm certainly not going to make you do it. So fortunately, graphing calculators can do this arithmetic. Previously, we used a graphing calculator. We used Desmos to determine the linear regression using the least squareds method. And along with calculating the equation for the line, hopefully you noticed, again, R should look familiar, the calculator also calculated the value R. Did you notice that when we did this last time, that it found your slope, it found your y-intercept, but you also saw an R value hanging out there? Yeah, it found your correlation coefficient. So we're going to use technology to compute the value of the correlation coefficient. And you've actually already done this before. So I would like you to use the data set. We just have three points. We're keeping it real simple. And I would like you to use Desmos. Do exactly what you did yesterday. You're going to make a table with your points. You're going to do that whole, um, remember how we did this? We did the whole, so make a table. So I'm going to make some notes here. So you're going to make a table on Desmos. You're going to then use that whole y sub 1 is approximately m times x sub 1 plus b. Remember how we did that yesterday? You're going to do that again today. Only now, instead of just looking for the equation, look for the correlation coefficient. Look for that r. It shows up. So I have, uh, go ahead and do this for part A, hop onto desmos.com slash calculator, put in your table, do your little y's approximately mx plus b, and then find your correlation go coefficient and write it down. Go ahead and hit pause to work this out, and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So I'm going to go ahead and go to Desmos. And I'm going to bring it over here. Hey, hi, Desmos. So I'm going to go ahead and go to Desmos. Oh, dear. Just kidding. And I'm going to go ahead and remember how we made a table. There was the plus sign, and we brought up a table, and I went ahead and put it in. My first point is 23, 23. My next point is 1, 2. My next point was 3, 4. Um, again, I can't see all of my points, so it might be a good idea to maybe zoom out a little bit. There we go. Just like last time, I'm going to go ahead and put in that little y sub 1. And remember, on Desmos, it's very convenient. You can just type y1. So easy. Um, and remember, we did approximately, we did the tilde, the little squiggly, um, mx sub 1. And I can just type x1 plus b. And remember, last time, we used the slope. We used the y-intercept. But check it out. It gives me my R value. Look at that. And in this case, it does say R equals 1, which uh, makes sense. It looks like my line of regression kind of hit every point there. So my R value is 1. So isn't that cool? Last time we used the slope and the y-intercept, but it turns out this trick also gives you the R value. 
So I'm going to go ahead and write that down. My R, my correlation coefficient, R equals 1. So can you take a minute, now that you see that R equals 1, can you interpret the correlation coefficient for me? Can you tell me what that R equals 1 means? Go ahead and hit pause to write it down, uh, what it means, and hit play when you're ready to check your work. So the first thing I noticed is that it was positive. So that means there's definitely a positive correlation. The other thing is I noticed it was right at one. Did you notice that? Did you catch that? Oh my gosh, it is a very strong positive linear correlation. Because of course we said the closer it gets to zero, the weaker the correlation, the closer it gets to one or negative one, the stronger the correlation. And because it is a, it is a positive one, it is a very strong correlation and it is definitely positive. So now that we got the feel for this, now that we know how this works, let's go over to page 181. I have a whole new table for you today. Um, a group of friends completed a survey about their monthly income and how much they pay for rent each month. And so here I have my table that shows my results. Here's their monthly net income in dollars and their monthly rent in dollars. So I would like you, we're going we're gonna to play with this. First of all, can you identify just the independent and dependent quantities in this problem situation? Because, of course, that tells us what X is, that tells us what Y is. So start with that, hit pause, identify your independent quantity, identify your dependent quantity, and then hit play to keep going. So you probably did this pretty quick. We've done it a lot now. The independent quantity is our monthly net income. And our dependent variable or quantity, I put variable, sorry, is our monthly rent. So that means this is going to be my X. Hang on, I got my pen. This is going to be my X and this is going to be my Y. This is my independent. This is my dependent. So I would like you, and you can totally use Desmos to help you do this, or you can just straight up do it by hand. Either way is fine with me. But I would like you to put all of these points on your lovely graph. It might be a little faster to do them by hand, um, but you are welcome to use Desmos as well. So go ahead and hit pause, sketch your scatter plot, get that going, and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. Um, if you do them by hand, that's totally fine. That's totally allowable. 14, and again, it would be an estimate because here would be $1,400 and about $4.50 a month in rent. So I'm going to put a little dot there. Oh, dear. Um, $15.50 would be, would it be, oh, dear. Um, that would be about here. Again, we're kind of estimating a little bit. And $5.05 would be like just past that. Um, but you get the idea. And again, if you use Desmos, that's fine, too. You would have had to have adjusted your, your zoomy bit so that you can see this a little bit better. Um, so this is what I did on Desmos. Let me erase my points there. They're funky. Go away, little points. But you get the idea. Again, mine doesn't line up too well, but you get the idea. So you can see what's going on here. And already in your mind, you're probably already thinking about that correlation coefficient, what a line would look like, all that good stuff. Um, I did go ahead and label monthly net income in dollars on my x-axis and monthly rent in dollars on my y-axis. I felt that was important. So um, do you think a linear regression equation would best describe this situation? I do, right? I mean, looking at it, the graph appears to be pretty linear. I, I could draw a line right through that pretty well, right? So this is where you do need to use Desmos. Go ahead and use Desmos to determine uh, whether a line of best fit is appropriate for this data. So to start off with part A, go ahead, put your table into Desmos, Get your linear regression equation on, all right, people? Just like we did last lesson. So go ahead and hit pause, use Desmos to get all this in there, and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So um, I'm gonna bring up my Desmos. Desmos, come back to me. Um, I'm gonna redo my table, right? Um, I'm not even gonna delete, I'm just gonna put in the table. So 1400 and we have 450, 1550 and we had 505, 2000 and we had 545 
And I'm going to keep going here. You probably already have this because you've got skills. Here we go. Um, so I'm now on my table in here. And you know the funny part about this is because I just left everything. Um, this was constantly recalculating as I put in my numbers. I don't know if you noticed that, but as I put new numbers into my table, this was just constantly recalculating. I do want to zoom out on this a bit, though, because um, I totally changed up the numbers. I'm going to zoom out a bit. Oh, there we go. There they all are. Hi, guys. Um, so let's take a look at what we've got here. So um, you're going to use this for a bit, so I'm going to use this to write my equation. I'm going to go ahead and round this to three digits behind the decimal. Um, for my y-intercept, I'm going to round to one digit behind the decimal just to make life a little bit easier for us. So for my slope, I'm using 0 0.282. And for my y-intercept, I'm just going to use 36.3. I know it's weird that we round it differently for each one, but we'll go with it for now. So here I have my lovely linear regression equation. Hooray! But you know that you also found the correlation coefficient. Can you go ahead and hit pause, flip back over to Desmos, hit pause, and write down your correlation coefficient there on page 182. Go ahead and hit pause to do that. Hit play to check your work. So we said the correlation coefficient was r. So there is my lovely r. It is a very lovely r. Uh, so there is r 0 0.9817. So I'm going to go ahead and write that down here. There's my correlation coefficient. So would a line of best fit, is there a strong correlation here? Would a line of best fit be appropriate for this data set? Go ahead and hit pause, write down your thoughts, hit play to keep going. I'm going to say, yeah, our line of best fit is pretty appropriate for this data because our R value is really close to one, isn't it? It's really close to one. So the correlation coefficient indicates the type and the strength of the relationship that may exist for a given set of data points, right? It tells us positive or negative. It tells us, you know, closer to zero, it's not a very strong relationship. Closer to one or negative one, it's a very strong relationship. Um, the coefficient of determination, because you may have also noticed there was an R squared in that little box. R squared is our coefficient of determination. And it measures how well the graph of the regression fits the data. It represents the percentage of variation of the observed values of the data points from their predicted values. So the correlation coefficient R indicates is it positive or negative correlation? Is it a really strong relationship or maybe not so much? The coefficient of determination tells us how well our regression line fits the data. And that's our R squared. So there is a little difference there. We're going to skip a little bit here. We're going to come over to page 184, um, M1-184. And I want us to start thinking back to our warm up a little bit. So now we know what correlation is. We know what the correlation coefficient is. We know it's helping us determine how strong the relationship is. Does correlation mean causation? What do you think causation means? Um, and that's a question that statisticians are always trying to determine. They've been working on this for years, people. They have whole careers based on this stuff, all right? So... I'd like you to read through the three true statements that Alonzo and Richard are given by their Algebra 1 teacher. Again, this is on page M1-184. There's three statements that their Algebra 1 teacher gave them. She asked them to decide what conclusions they can draw from the data. And I want you to go through all three of these, one, two, and three. Do you agree with them? If so, why? If you don't agree with them, why not? So go ahead and hit pause. Look at the statement and the conclusion that Alonzo and Richard reached. Do you agree or disagree and why? Go ahead and hit pause to work these out and then hit play when you're ready to keep the discussion going. So number one, the number of smartphones sold in the United States has increased every year since 2005. 
The number of flat screen televisions sold in the United States has also increased during the same period. So people are buying more cell phones, smartphones, people are buying more flat screen TVs. Alonzo and Richard reached the conclusion that owning a cell phone causes a person to buy a flat screen TV. Do you agree with that? Uh, I don't. There is no evidence that buying a smartphone causes somebody to buy a flat screen television, right? I don't buy my smartphone and go, well, now that I have a smartphone, I should go get a flat screen TV. Like, that's not a thing. That's not a thing. Since 2004, the average salary of an NFL football player has increased every year. The average weight of an NFL player has also increased yearly since 2004. After much discussion, Alonzo and Richard reached the conclusion that higher salaries cause the players to gain weight. Um, I'm going to disagree with that as well. The increase in pay does not cause a player to gain weight. It may be that now that they're getting paid more, maybe it feels more competitive and they feel they have to put on more muscle and be stronger to play. But just because they got paid more doesn't mean that it's why they started gaining weight. There are other factors here, right? Worldwide, the number of automobiles sold annually has steadily increased since 1920. Fair enough, for the last 100 years. Gasoline production has also steadily increased since 1920. Alonso and Richard concluded that the increase in the number of automobiles sold caused an increase in the amount of gasoline produced. I, I, that feels reasonable to me, right? It does seem reasonable that the increase in the number of automobiles has caused an increase in the amount of gasoline produced. More people driving means you need more gasoline to power those cars. Although more and more companies are moving toward electric these days. That's not a bad thing. So proving causation is challenging. The scenarios Alonzo and Richard analyzed demonstrate that even though the two quantities were correlated, right, there was a relationship there, there was a strong correlation, this does not mean that one quantity caused the other quantity. This is one of the most misunderstood and misapplied uses of statistics. Just because we can see that two things are related doesn't mean that one caused the other to happen. And it's so misused, especially these days. You guys have social media accounts. You know what I'm talking about. Causation is when one event affects the outcome of a second event. While a correlation is a necessary condition for causation, a correlation is not a sufficient condition for causation. So if you, uh, so you have to have a correlation for causation to have to, for it to be a causation, because if there's no correlation, then there's definitely no causation, right? But only seeing a correlation is not a sufficient condition for causation. Just because something's related doesn't mean one caused the other to happen. So while determining a correlation is straightforward, right? It's pretty easy to numerically calculate out, right? We use Desmos, hey, there's my correlation. Using statistics to establish causation is very, very difficult. So I have a few things that I'd like you to take a look at. We're going to start with number four. Many medical studies have tried to prove that smoking causes lung cancer. I have a whole bunch of questions here, A, B, C, D, that I would like you to answer regarding this medical study. Go ahead and hit pause. Jot down your thoughts on this on page 185, and then hit play when you're ready to check your work. So to start us off, is smoking a necessary condition for lung cancer? Why or why not? Um, no, it is. You can get lung cancer without ever having smoked. That that is something that can happen, definitely. Um, question B: Is smoking a sufficient condition for lung cancer? Why or why not? Well, no, because not every person who smokes gets lung cancer, right? There, you know, people smoke and they get lung cancer, and there are people who smoke and don't get lung cancer. Is there a correlation between people who smoke and people who get lung cancer? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there is a correlation, right? Smokers have a much higher incidence of lung cancer than non-smokers, right? If you're a smoker, it's a much higher chance that you're going to get lung cancer. So there is a correlation. So is it true that smoking causes lung cancer? And if so, 
How is it proven? Um, it is true. Smoking does cause lung cancer. Now, scientists have proven that smoking causes lung cancer by first finding a high correlation between smokers and lung cancer. That's what they did first, right? First, they're like, hey, there is a correlation here. But remember, that's not enough to prove it. So scientists then went further. Once they saw the correlation, then by discovering that smoking damages lung tissue, which encourages the development of lung cancer. So first they found the correlation, but then they went further and they started looking for causation. And when they saw that smoking was damaging lung tissue, they realized that was what was encouraging the development of lung cancer. That was the causation. So the correlation gave them something to look at, but they needed further evidence to prove it. So with that in mind, go ahead and take a look at number five. It is often said that teenage drivers cause automobile accidents. Go ahead and hit pause, answer all the questions here, and then hit play when you're ready to keep the discussion going. So is being a teenage driver a necessary condition to have an automobile accident? Why or why not? No, <laughs> drivers other than teenagers have accidents, right? You don't have to be a teenager to get into a car accident. It happens to all ages. Um, is being a teenage driver a sufficient condition to have an automobile accident? Why or why not? And again, I'm gonna say no. Not all teenage drivers have accidents, right? There are some teenagers that don't have accidents at all. So I would say it's not a sufficient condition. Now, is there a correlation between teenage drivers and automobile accidents? Yes. Yes, there is a correlation. If you look at the data, teenage drivers have a higher accident rate than other drivers, which is why your insurance company is going to charge you more if you're a teenager than when you're a little bit older like me. So is it true that teenage drivers cause automobile accidents? To some degree, yes, right? It's not 100%. But teenage drivers do have more accidents, and that's for a variety of reasons, right? It can be caused by a number of related factors, riskier behaviors, right? Teenagers, y'all think you're invincible and you do crazy stuff that me at 44 would never do. Um, teenager drivers have less experience, right? I have been driving for years and years. I've been driving for 28 years, people. I've been driving for a long time. I have a lot more experience. And the other, there may be a factor of more distractions, right? I'm an adult. I set the phone down. That message can wait until I get home, all right, or get to where I'm going. Um, but often for teenagers, there's more distractions. You want to check your phone. You've got friends in the car. You've got the music up and playing. There are often more distractions. So there's a lot of factors that can cause that. There are two relationships that are often mistaken for causation, and that's where we want to be careful. A common response is when some other reason may cause the same result, right? There could be another reason. And a confounding variable, and that's when there are other variables that are unknown or unobserved. There could be other things going on that we don't know about. So I would like you to, number seven, consider each relationship and list two or more common responses that could also cause this result. Go ahead and hit pause to work your way through these scenarios and then hit play when you're ready to keep the discussion going. So in North Carolina, the number of shark attacks increases when the temperature increases. Therefore, a temperature increase appears to cause sharks to attack. Um, there could be other things, right? The temperature increases in the summer and people are more likely to go on vacation. And you know, if the temperature increases, they're more likely to be at the beach, right? There are other factors that could be at work here, not necessarily that sharks get hungrier. <laughs> I don't necessarily know that's what's happening. There could be other things. Um, a company claims that their weight loss pill caused people to lose 20 pounds when, followed by the, um, when following the accompanying exercise program. Um, you know, my thought on this was it could be the weight loss pill, but if they're also following an exercise program, People may lose weight just by following the exercise program. Maybe they would have lost the same amount of weight without even doing the pill, right? Um, there are other things that could have caused this to happen, other common responses. 
As always, guys, I hope you found this helpful. I hope you found this useful. If you've got questions or concerns, email me. Come see me during lunch or during office hours. Come talk to me and I'll help you out. I'll see you guys later. Bye.